Come on, church, make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house now. Y'all ready for the Word of God today? Amen. Welcome to Discovery Church for everyone outside in the courtyard or outdoor or online. We're so glad that you are here. We're just continuing a journey that we actually started last week on Easter Sunday, which, by the way, wasn't that phenomenal, man, Easter Sunday, the experience. We had over 6,800 people come to church on Easter, man, over the course of those three days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to our Easter at Discovery experience. 579 people gave their life to Christ. Come on, you guys. They filled out a card. They said they checked off a box. I'm talking, not just hands raised. I'm talking about they filled out a card, man. That's a record here at Discovery, and we're excited about life change. So wherever you're at in your stage of faith, um, whether you're like new to the things of God, or maybe you've been walking with God for a while, I think this series is going to minister to you. I believe there's more that God has for you. There's a next step in your faith that, that God has for you. And we're going we're gonna to continue to study kind of those last words of Jesus. If you were here on Easter at Discovery... Um, Jesus kind of met with some people after his resurrection. He, he kind of showed up and appeared to a few people. We talked about how that kind of reveals Jesus' heart and what he wants us to know by who he spoke to and what he said. And, and we're going to kind of talk a little bit more about what Jesus said after his resurrection. He wasn't around for long, 40 days, and then he went and ascended up into heaven. So these are his final words, a lot of what we're going to study, which were important. If you think about the final, anyone's final words, extremely important and intentional, Jesus' final words. This series is titled, Come Holy Spirit. Can you say that with me? Come on. Come, Holy Spirit. Yeah, this is a prayer. We titled this a prayer because I'm going to be leading you through. If there's ever a series I've asked you to commit to, here's one I want you to commit to for the next four weeks. So I'm going to lead you through a prayer that we'll pray together for four weeks as we get closer and closer, become more aware of who this person is. Not a force or an energy or an it. But the person of the Holy Spirit, he is very much God, as much God as the Father and the Son. He is God, the Holy Spirit. And in a lot of different circles, he gets a bad rap, man. And there's a lot of confusion when it comes around the topic and the person of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to hopefully demystify, de-spookify the Holy Spirit because I believe he, ha he plays and he's intended to play a very important, critical, crucial role in your life, like if you really knew who he was, you'd want him in your life. You'd pray, come Holy Spirit, amen? So let me begin this journey today, laying the foundation of the series, as I often do in our first uh, message in our series, lay a foundation. Today's gonna be very teachy, very teachy. Got a lot of scriptures. I need to, I need to teach you some things uh, of, of the Bible. Sometimes I get preachy. I get excited, I'll preach. But today, I need to teach the Bible. It's gonna feel like a Bible study almost, y'all. So I need to lay the groundwork. John chapter seven is where I'd like to begin in the gospel of John again. Although it's early in his gospel, most of John's gospel is, it's actually the last like, days of Jesus. And so from John 7, this is like the final 10 months of Jesus. So it's the latter, still the latter part of his life where he starts to talk about his death and resurrection. And he starts to talk about the Holy Spirit a lot as well. Let me show it to you in John chapter 7, verse 37. It says, on the last and greatest day of the festival. Whoa, let me time out right there. I need to tell you what festival this is because it's important to the context. This is the Festival of Tabernacles, something the Hebrews would celebrate every year. And it had to do with them getting delivered from Egypt. But specifically, it was a celebration of the water coming from the rock. If you're familiar with the story of, of the Israelites being like, they're, they're starving, they're, they're dehydrated, they're about to die. Moses strikes this rock and water comes from it. They celebrate this every year in the Feast of Tabernacles. And this is the scene that John chapter 7 is in. So here's how the, the Feast of Tabernacles works. A priest would actually go to a pool of Siloam, these holy waters, and he'd take a cistern, and he'd get the holy waters, and he'd take it all the way to the altar of God in the temple. And on the way, everyone would shout praises and psalms and sing to God, uh, and they would pour out the, this fresh water on the altar, and they would do that every day except on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And this is the day, the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. 
Now, isn't that great to know the context of that story, that, that Jesus was basically saying, I am the water from the rock. I am the one who, who actually went to and fed the starving, dehydrated Israelites. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. For whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And by this, he meant the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to later receive. Why later? Look what it says. Up to that time, the Spirit had not yet been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Now, the Holy Spirit is God, the Holy Spirit, and has always been God. You see him in creation in Genesis. He is the spirit hovering over the deep. You see him operating all throughout the Old Testament, filling people and working and moving. Probably one of the greatest examples of the Holy Spirit inside of the Old Testament is in the life of Samson, who when the Holy Spirit was filling Samson, he gave him supernatural strength. But, but this happened, the Holy Spirit would be like select, only selectively show up and temporarily show up in people's lives. It was only until the death and resurrection of Jesus that the Holy Spirit would indwell, would be given to us because our sins had been paid for. So this is, this is why he starts to teach about a, a, a new relationship with this Spirit of God, but, but they, hadn't, they couldn't even grasp it yet. They just didn't click yet, but he started to lay some groundwork that later they would, they would get, they would understand that this Spirit, he likened it to a river of living water. I love, I love moving water. I love just watching water. Is anyone like that? Just going to the beach and watching water. You know, I used to, when I was younger, I liked to get in the water. Now I just chill and watch it. I just like looking at water or any moving water, rivers or waterfalls. It's just beautiful and relaxing to me. When we put a pool in our backyard, I made sure they put some waterfalls in there because I just like to drink some coffee and watch the water. I hardly even get in the pool. You know, I'm just like, just watching the water, you know? And then I had them put a hot tub, a jacuzzi in there too. Now, I get in that thing. I don't get in the pool anymore. I get in that thing. I love the jacuzzi. Give me some bubbles and some heat and some, it's comfortable. And I was thinking about this as, as Jesus was explaining the Holy Spirit as this river of living water within us and my hot tub, as much as I like the hot tub, it's not a river. It's got, it's got bubbles, not life. You know, it's, 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 it's relaxing. It's, it's comfortable. It's, entertaining, but I wonder how many times we've replaced the rivers of the Holy Spirit with the jacuzzis of the flesh. You know, the, the Bible says there's a mark of the last days. The apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that there'd be a bunch, a mark of the last days, the end times would be there would be a bunch of people who call themselves Christians. They would have a form of godliness, but deny the power. And we have to be very careful and guard our hearts, my brothers, my, my sisters in Christ, that we don't settle for a religious semblance without any substance. That, that, that not having the power of the Holy Spirit means not living the abundant life that Jesus actually made available to us. This is, that, that, that was, that's the hot tub version of Christianity, right? It's man-made and man-controlled. It's relaxing, but religion creates spiritual hot tubs. Jesus gives us rivers of living water. Like, it's time for us to receive and release uh, the, the Holy Spirit and not settle for the stationary ponds of religion anymore, you guys. So maybe look at your life right now. Are you stuck in a routine? Are you not moving forward in the things of God? Are you tired of the same old things? It might be that you've substituted life-giving, flowing rivers for man-made hot tubs. God has so much more for your life. God has so much more. And here at Discovery, I want you to know, we pursue all that God has for us. Everything God has for us, we desire it, okay? And so Jesus would drop some seeds and, and would explain this relationship with the Spirit that, that they couldn't even comprehend it. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is talking about here, again, the Spirit of God. But previous to this verse, I'm going to show you verse 9, he's talking about how in generations before, they couldn't access it. Because Jesus had not been glorified. But he says this in verse 9. No eye has seen and no ear has heard. No mind has even conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. They couldn't even comprehend this thing. And wouldn't it be a tragedy for us to show up in heaven and not have received what God actually prepared for us? Like God made available for us some things. He prepared some things for us. And we're not even going to go after it. He says, but God has revealed it to us. 
by his, and he introduces the concept again of the Holy Spirit. This is how God has revealed to us his power, his is through the Spirit. Now, the word for spirit in the Bible, spirit, is, the Greek word is pneuma. It's where we get pneumonia. And the word, of course, pneumonia is like a lung or a breathing disorder because the word pneuma means a blast of breath or a current of strong wind. This is, this is what the Bible says the Spirit is. It's, it likens it. It's like, like a wind is, you, you can feel it when the wind hits you. Right? When the wind hits you, you feel the wind. You don't know where it comes from sometimes, but you can experience the wind. This is what the Bible, the word that the Bible uses. And watch this next line. I don't know about you, but it's like a carrot dangling in front of me that I want to go after. He says, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. He says, there is so much more that God has for you. And I want to invite you into the place of the Spirit where you know this God more intimately, more personally, more powerfully. And that's my goal in this series is to make this something not like weird for you, not like put off for you, not something that pushes you away or turns you off, but something you actually want because some of you have been swimming in the shallow end of the pool for long enough. And it's time to venture out into the deep things of God that he has prepared for you. So Paul says, I'm desperate for it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, my message and my preaching, it was not with wise and persuasive words, which that's what a lot of people's faith is like. That's their version of Christianity. It's just words. It's just ideas. It's just belief systems. It's something we can explain. And Paul could have gone there because Paul was an educated man. He would have probably graduated in the comparative, like, like seminary of the day. He was a Pharisee of Pharisee. So he could have went there and been like persuasive words with his hands like, but he said, that's not the gospel that I presented to you, but it was a demonstration of the spirit's power so that your faith wouldn't rest on, on the reasoning of human wisdom, but on God's power. And then a few verses later, he says, for the kingdom of God is not just a matter of talk, but it's living by God's power. This is what the kingdom of God is. This is what God has revealed to us by his spirit in these days, post-resurrection of Jesus. It's not living a Christian version that's just a matter of talk or ideas or belief system. It's living by the power of God. This, and the word he uses here for power is dunamis, and that's where we get dynamite from. It literally means supernatural strength or supernatural strength. Ability, and this is what God has for you. This is what he has prepared for you. This is what it means to be a disciple, what it always was intended to look like after the resurrection of Jesus, that we would receive power. And I want to invite you into that because God has more for you. Okay, all that you have is not all that God has. God has more. So here's what we're going to do today. I'm going to give you a theological teaching. I'm going, to ex- ex- I'm going to get really teaching and theological with you, and then I'm going to explain maybe practically why some of us aren't going after this that God has made available, and then I'm going to give you an invitation. But let me give you three things that God wants for you, and this is the theological part of the message. The biblical term is baptism. This is what God wants for you and invites you into baptism. But, but there's actually three baptisms that are available to you. And a lot of people don't realize this, but there's more than one baptism. And the word baptize or baptism actually has nothing to do with your, like, with water, with your sprinkling and getting dunked. In fact, the word baptizo does not have anything. It just means to be fully immersed in. That's all the word means, to be fully immersed in. So wherever you are, whatever level you're in, there's probably more. That's probably not enough. You might want to dive into the rivers of living water that God has for you, Okay. Because there's more immersed, there's much, there's a much more immersive experience that God has for you. So there's three, and this is this is just what God invites you into. Let me give them to you: the three baptisms that God invites you into. And the first one, you probably never heard this explained like this, but I'm gonna show it to you in the Bible. The first one is the baptism in the body of Christ, and that's actually what salvation is. Now a lot of people haven't haven't heard baptism in the body as like something to explain salvation, but that's actually what the, what the Bible calls it. So let me show it to you. In the scriptures, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 says, for we, will all, we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. So in other words, when you gave your life to Jesus, you didn't just join Jesus, you joined Jesus' family. 
That's what happened. So, so you gave your life to Christ. That's great. You and God, which, which is the best part of salvation, by the way? You have Jesus. That's by far the best part. But that's not the only part. There's more that God has for you. That you don't just join Jesus. You're to join the family of God. This is, we're not just individual Christians. God never intended you to be an individual Christian. If we, look, if we were individual, if we were just individual Christians, kind of separate, doing our own experience thing with God, then we wouldn't even to gather on church on Sunday. There'd be no reason for us to gather on, to, together. We would just get information to individual Christians, just get your own information, but you're not an individual Christian. We are a family of God. We are a flock of God. We are the body of Christ. The Bible uses all this group terminology when explaining who we are. And for some of you, listen to me, you've been baptized into Jesus like you've got a relationship with God, but, but you have yet to experience this immersion, this baptism into salvation because although you have a relationship with God, you don't, you don't have an, a relationship with God's family. And this is always what God, what this baptism, what salvation was supposed to be is not just in a, in a relationship with Jesus, but a relationship with his family. It's the same thing. Can I say it like this? You need the church. And you need, you need to be in church. You need to belong to a church. You need to be in a church. It's funny, the logic of some people in our culture today, we're such individualized, compartmentalized people. We're just, we're just we, we don't, the, the logic, I, I'll tell people this. I'll be like, you need, you need a church. You need to be in church. Church is good for you. And, and when you're not in church, your spiritual life suffers and your church family needs you. And they go, that's legalistic, pastor. So people, that's legalistic. No, I am the church. I don't need to go to church. I am the church. And I'm like, that logic just doesn't work anywhere else, dude. Because a coach will tell you, your, your volleyball coach or your baseball coach or whatever coach will tell you, look, hey, you need to be in practice. Because when you don't practice, your, your game suffers and, and, and it's going to hurt your playing time and your team needs you. And then you go, oh yeah, absolutely. I need to show up for practice. It's the same logic. It's you need the family of God. This is the immersion. This is the first baptism that God invites you into. Galatians chapter three says it like this. You are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you, look at this, we're baptized into Christ. That's a different baptism. That's an immersion into Jesus. You've clothed yourself with Christ. Okay, that's the first baptism. The second baptism is something probably, when you think of baptism, you're more familiar with, but it is a separate experience. And I need to, I need to um, explain that very, very well today. It's a separate experience, and it's separate on purpose. But the second baptism is water baptism. And that's when we take our faith public now. We go public with our faith, where it's not just an individual thing between me and God. Oh, me and God are good. No, now it's I go public with my faith, and it's a separate experience. Meaning, okay, well, why is it separate then? Why isn't it combined with salvation and baptism one thing? Because listen, anytime you combine something that you have to do, with the finished work that Jesus already did for you, it violates the word of God, that you are saved by faith, through grace, not by any work. So there are some people that say, hey, no, you gotta get baptized. Unless you get baptized, you're not saved. That is not true. That is not biblical at all. Any, any work that you do for salvation violates what Jesus did. It cancels what Jesus did on the cross. Listen to me, this is so important. You cannot pray enough, give enough, read the Bible enough, serve enough, get baptized enough. It's all Jesus' work for salvation. It's all him. But after, see, that's the beginning. That's the first baptism. After that, there's still more that God has for you. Acts chapter 241 says, those who accepted the message, that's the first baptism. I accepted Jesus. They were baptized in water. So now they decided, I'm not gonna let others know. I'm just not gonna be a private Christian. I need to publicly acknowledge before everyone my faith in Jesus. But it doesn't save you. Some people even say, not only is it baptism that saves you, it's actually together. Until you get baptized, you're not saved. They'll even go even further. Some people say that the words that they say the dude says when he's baptizing you, if he says the wrong words, and it didn't take. It didn't, you didn't, you, the osmosis of salvation didn't happen or something like that. The waters didn't take on you. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me, dude. Like, like you're, you're telling me I'm in the water. Like, I'm underwater. I don't know what this guy's saying, but he's saying some stuff. I go under the water, he says some stuff. I come out of the water in love with Jesus. You mean to tell me I'm gonna stand before Jesus and he's gonna be like, in heaven. Oh, Jason, I'm so sorry. 
that he said the wrong words when you're under the water. You can't come in. I'm sorry. That's not how it works. Some people say, no, you got to say in the baptism, when you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And other people say, you got to say in Jesus' name. And if you don't say that, then it doesn't work and you're not saved. And that's ridiculous. That's not biblical. It's not biblical. It's a separate experience. It's not the work. Their salvation is through the cross of Jesus by faith through grace. There is a second experience of baptism that God does invite you into. So when I used to baptize people years ago, I would, I would just like... I'd be like, in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, and in Jesus' name. There you go. Just let's not. <laughs> you got to be kidding me, man. That's not the point. And the point, the point is this, and it is a good point. That, like, the point of baptism is important. It's that now that you're a disciple, you're a follower of Jesus, that you don't keep your faith private. You acknowledge your Lord and Savior who gave it all for you. He bought your soul, paid for your soul, that you acknowledge that before men. Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter 10. Whoever acknowledges me before men, so it's not just in your heart privately, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But look what he says. Whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. And you don't want that. So let me encourage you. Some of you, God is inviting you to more. And the more that, that, that in your relationship and walk with God, the more for you is this step here. And we're doing it today. Some of you need to take your faith public. You need to... Stop being the private Christian. I got Jesus in my heart, Christian. Depending on who I'm hanging out with, they know I'm a Christian. You need to go all in with God and take this second step of baptism and be, brought, be water baptized. But then there is, there's a third baptism, which, by the way, the Bible talks about this third baptism in multiples, more than the other two combined. It says more about this baptism. And that's the baptism in the Holy Spirit. This is a separate experience Nothing to do with salvation. In fact, salvation is about your eternal experience in heaven, okay? The baptism of the Holy Spirit isn't about your eternal heaven experience. It's about your earthly experience. You can live a spirit-empowered life right now. That's what this baptism is about. And again, you say, Jason, why is it separate? It's separate than the salvation experience because God never wanted to complicate salvation. It was done by the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, period. So some people will say, well, no, if you, you, that happened at, at salvation, you have the Holy Spirit at salvation. Well, yes, don't, you do have, but there's still a separate experience for you, and I'm going to show it to you in the Bible. I'm going to show you through the scriptures how this is a separate baptism, a separate experience that God wants to invite you into. Rem these aren't in your notes. i got a bunch of scriptures not in your notes. Just take some extra for me. Remember last... On Easter, a week ago, we were studying John 20. Let me show you another part of John 20 that we didn't get to, a little more of what Jesus said to his disciples in that upper room experience. John chapter 20, verse 19. We'll start there. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, he said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Look what happens next, though. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, at this moment, at this moment, the disciples got saved. They got saved right here. Now, if anyone's thinking, but what do you mean the disciples got saved? They've known Jesus for three years. Walk with Jesus. Listen to Jesus. They cast out demons in his name and stuff. Yeah, but they weren't saved because sins have not been paid for yet. They could not be saved. They knew Jesus. They followed Jesus. They adhered to his teachings, but they could not be saved. It was at this moment that they received the indwelling. It was the first baptism. That's what they received. Faith in Jesus. They receive the indwelling of the Spirit. Look at the same account in another gospel. In Luke, he's writing the same thing in a, in a different perspective. It's Luke's perspective now. Look what it says. Jesus says, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in this city until you have been clothed, here's that word again, with power from on high. Now he says, until you've been. That's future tense. Wait a second. You just breathe the Holy Spirit on them. What am I waiting for then? Okay, let me show you the book of Acts. Now, for those of you who don't know the Bible, the Gospels are the account of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And then Acts is, is the next book of the Bible in your New Testament. And that records a little bit. It starts with Jesus like 
resurrected body experience, some of the stuff he had conversations, some of the stuff that was actually written at the end of the Gospels, and then it's a record of the early church and all like what God did through the early church. In Acts chapter 1, it recounts the same story we, we're, we've read in these two Gospels, John and Luke, of what Jesus said. Look, at, look what it says in Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 3. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, what occasion was that? The one we just read in John 20 and Luke 24. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, I know this is hard to understand, your mind can't grasp it yet, but I'm trying to help you guys out here. John baptized with water, but in a few days, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Oh, wait a second, I thought they were already baptized in the Holy Spirit. No, that was the first baptism. That was the first baptism, the, 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 where you get the infilling of the Holy Spirit. They haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit yet, as we see all throughout the New Testament as a separate experience. And then a few verses later, Jesus says, but you will receive powers. There's that, there's that word again, dunamis. You will receive supernatural strength, supernatural ability when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Okay, this is, this is what God has prepared. It's separate experiences. In fact, let me show it to you. I'm going to show you one story. Now, this is in your notes. One story in the, in the book of Acts that has all three baptisms separated so you can see it. They're all separate experiences, all three baptisms that God invites us into. In Acts chapter 8, here's the story. It says, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed Christ there. Now, this is what all the apostles are doing. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. They start spreading out. They're preaching the gospel. All of them are doing it. Philip's in Samaria. And it says, when they believed Philip, so that's the first baptism. They believed salvation. He preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. They were, second baptism, baptized in water, both men and women. And look what it says, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard about it, so denominational headquarters gets wind of Samaria? Samaria got the gospel? Samaria accepted Jesus? Samaria accepted the word of God? They sent Peter and John to them. They sent the big dogs over to Samaria. Go check that out. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Watch this, because the Holy Spirit, the third baptism, had not yet come upon any of them. And then it gives even more clarity. Look what it says. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. All three separate experiences where God is going to take you to a deeper place. It's not necessary for salvation, but it is necessary if you want to live a spirit-filled, empowered life. Now, there might be some bias. Some people have bias to this teaching because maybe you saw some weird stuff. You heard some weird stuff. You've experienced some weird stuff. Honestly, people can be weird, right, with this stuff. But how many you know you could be spirit-filled and not spooky? You all know that, okay? All right? Let me even further illustrate this, and then I'm going to get really practical. But in 1 John chapter 5, I love these two verses, verse 7 and 8, because the first verse talks about the Trinity. Let me show it to you. In verse 7, it says, For there are three that bear witness, notice where, in heaven. And what are the three that are eternally, right now, they're bearing witness in heaven? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And the Word, by the way, is Jesus. That's, that's what the Bible and John calls Jesus. In John chapter 1, remember, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and was manifest among us. This is Jesus. So there is in heaven, right now, the Father, the Word, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And these three, he says, are one. They're all God. They are co-eternal, co-equal. The Trinity is explained in verse 7. These three are one. And then look at verse 8. And there are three that bear witness not on heaven, but on earth. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the blood is the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross at Calvary. That's, the, that's your first baptism. The water is the second baptism that we take our faith public. And the Spirit is the third baptism where God gives you power. Look, and then he says this, and these three agree as one, but the question is, do you agree with it? 
Because this is, this is an agreement. As much as in heaven there is an agreement with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, on earth there is an agreement with the three baptisms, the immersions that God has for you. They are one. It's the journey that God designed for you, prepared advance for you, and Jesus tried to usher his disciples into, and the early church into. And we come to God, and we have these conditional prayers sometime. And we say, God, I'll take this, but not that, and don't do that. And, and God is not honored with our conditional. He's not even answering those conditional prayers. I don't know about you, but I need more of God. I need God's power to function. Not, not, just, not for fun, but for function. Come on, the Holy Spirit isn't for fun in your life. It's for function in your life. I need, I need his power in my marriage and my family. I need his power in this church. I want to see miracles, signs, and wonders, and healing happen in this place. I need the power of God. I mean, I can do okay by myself, but by myself, I'm not enough. So I, why, why, like, why? Why then do some people not go after this? Why aren't we, why aren't we asking, come Holy Spirit? When, when all throughout the scriptures we see this is available, what's been prepared for us, what they experience, why do we not? And I think there's a few reasons why. Some people don't. They're reluctant to embrace the Holy Spirit and say, come, Holy Spirit. I think there's a few. I got three for you today. Number one is this. I think some people are just uninformed. We're uninformed. Like it's not a matter of you rejecting it. It's just you didn't know about the Holy Spirit, which you're in good company if that's you today. It's actually a better, better place to be than an outright rejection, okay? There are people in the Bible that didn't know and had to be taught about the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 19, this is further into the book of Acts, people still didn't know about the Holy Spirit there. Look what it says. It says, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. And there at Ephesus, he found some disciples. So these are followers of Jesus. He asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, no. We haven't even heard about the Holy Spirit. That's what people are still saying today. Now they're going to heaven. These people are going to heaven, but they're just not experiencing the abundant life that Jesus promised, that what God has prepared for them. And you go read the account. Paul just kind of walks them through it and helps them see and, and, into embracing the Holy Spirit. And that's what we like to do here at Discovery. That's just step by step, but let me just say, the, the, the priority of our church is the gospel of Jesus Christ and the first baptism. That's the priority, okay? But that's the beginning, not the end. There is so much more that God has for you, and there's a lot of people who are uninformed. They've got wrong ideas of what the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the person of the Holy Spirit, how he actually operates in our life. And I'm going to help you out in this series that you would actually pray, intentionally come Holy Spirit and know what you're saying. Some people don't know. I don't know. They're uninformed. I remember years ago, I was at, I was at, a, um, at a grocery store in the checkout lane, and there was this, this uh, person doing the checkout, this lady. I could tell she was a Christian. She had a cross on every person, and there was a few people ahead of me. She's, God bless you, and talking to me. She's just planting seeds, little evangelists. I'm like, this girl, I mean, the, she's awesome. So I, 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 she's checking me out, and I see the cross. I'm like, hey, so that's a nice, that's a nice necklace. What is that? playing a little dumb, you know what I mean? Sometimes I do this because I want to see it, like, how people react. And so she's like, she like lights up, like I got a prospect here. She's like, oh, this, this is my cross. And oh my gosh, it means so much to me. Do you go to church? And I'm like, no, I don't. I had to lie a little bit. I repented afterwards. But sometimes I just, I don't get to like have the experience a lot of people get. So I'm like, let me check this. I'm like, no, what's what, what do you mean? And she said, oh, she's so excited. Tell me about her church. She's telling me about her church and stuff. And she, one thing she said was this, and I, and I sing. I'm on the singing team. You might see me sing at that church if you come. And it's good. Well, I mean, our music is good, but, but we're not like, like overly, you know, passionate. And, and we're not like charismatic or anything. And she said it like that. Or charismatic or anything. And I was like, oh, what's, what's that? And, and she goes, you know, you, you know, it's people just really loud and, and they get excited. And I even heard they dance with snakes and stuff. That's not that. And I'm like, what, the snakes? No, I don't want none of that, okay? And there's just so many people who are uninformed about, like, like who the Holy Spirit is and what I mean, like charismatic even cares. That just means a grace gift. That's what that means, grace, gift, and power to be charismatic. God wants you all to have charisma. To have the, char char the, the charis, the gifts of God in your life. 
But that's the reason. Some of us are uninformed. The second reason is that, and this one's dangerous, so dangerous. And I felt like as I was studying that God wanted me to warn some of you here that have grown, write this down, apathetic. Some of you have grown apathetic. And that word apathetic is, is a, it's a combination of two words, a and pathos. It means without passion. So that literally means to live without passion. I felt in my study so strongly that God wanted me to just warn some of you that have gotten to this place. You're, and here's what you've said. Honestly, oh, it's not me. It's not my personality. You know, it's just not, that's not, you know, I don't get excited, you know, the worship or the, you know, that stuff. And I just, it's, it's just not me. Listen to me. Please hear me. You might be able to get by with, without passion and without, without this that I'm talking about today when things are good, but when things are not good and you get into a storm, heaven help you because you need a power beyond what you can control yourself. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And in the days we're living in and the days we're coming into as a, as, as a, as a culture, a society, in these latter days, you need power of the Holy Spirit. You need supernatural ability and supernatural strength operating in your life. And some of us are, we're just, we, we're living without passion in the things of God. And some people even talk down on the passion, like it's a negative thing. Like it's not, don't get emotional. Don't get too, yeah, emotional. And I get you, like there is emotionalism that exists. There is, there is that. But some people look down on it as if you, like, like your spirituality just exists up here. It's all a mind thing. It's all words and intellect and thought thing. And there is no passion. And Paul comes along and says in Romans chapter 12, 11, never be lacking in zeal. Don't, don't get caught slipping without passion in this life, with the Holy Spirit breathing, moving, breath in your wind and cells, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Some of us, we don't, we don't do this because we don't think we need it. I think, I'm, that's not me. And you're living without passion, and that's a dangerous place to be. And then the third thing is, is some of us have fear. We're, we're afraid if we went all in and did this, like... God will make me miserable. You know, God, I'll be poor and miserable if I let God take over. I mean, this is honestly something that I thought, like my first stages of Christianity and faith, I thought, man, if God, I'll be poor, broke. Like God, what if he sends me to Africa or something in a mud hut? Like God just, and so no, honestly, some of you have thought this. Some of you have thought, if I go all in with God, like I'd be, like I, I'm in trouble. I will get less. He'll take from me. And I'm telling you right now, the enemy has lied to you. The enemy is keeping some of you on the sideline of the shallow end of the pool. That you're, you're, he, you're saved, okay, you got, you got the first baptism, you got your toe in the water, and he can't touch that, but what he can do is help you live in fear so you don't operate in power so God has no use in your life. You're not impacting the kingdom of God or anybody, you're just like between you and God saved over there, and that's exactly where the enemy wants you. In the shallow end, not in the deep things that God has prepared for you. Why would, we, why would we not, you guys? If this is something God has prepared for us, if he has power for us, if God desires a journey for us that is an immersive experience into his spirit, why, why would we think it's not good? Everything God has for you is good. James chapter one says, every good and perfect is from above. If it's good, it's from God. God doesn't have bad things for you. He doesn't have evil for you. He has got good for you. And that's why I like to give this challenge, and I usually give it on Easter, but I decided to give it the, the, the day, the Sunday after Easter here, to give a challenge to go all in with God. Can you write that down? Here's my challenge. Here's the one application for this message today. Go all in. Give us one year of your life. And I've been saying this for 10 years and challenging people to test God, that with him in control of your life, you've gone this far, you've done this, like I get it. But what if God was in control for one year and you just gave us one year? When I say give us one year, I'm talking about, you know, everything we have here at Discovery for your spiritual journey, do it. So I'll tell pastors, some of you are like, one year, that's a long time. Dude, you've given so much of your time to so many lesser things. Things that like are just meaningless, worthless. Try God. Test God for a year. Right, and I tell pastors, like, I give this challenge, and I tell them, like, this has been good, man. People take me on this challenge. It changes people's life, and they're like, I don't know, Pastor Jay. It's like, you, get, you tell people to give a year? I'm like, Jesus said, give your life. Take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. I can't ask him to just test that for one year and see if God, in control of your life, doesn't make a better life, a good life for you. Like, in fact, it just doesn't work without that. It really doesn't work the way it was intended. 
in the shallow ends that you've been playing in. It doesn't. When I say go all in for a year, I mean like, here, like everything we have. I'm not saying go to Africa in a mud hut. That's not what I'm saying, okay? Keep your job. Do that stuff. I'm just saying give God control. And whatever we have for you here at Discovery, do it. So if, there's, if you're physically able to, get to church. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to be in God's house. Come to church. Go to the group. There's groups? Find one. Go to it. Go all in. You're, serve on a team. Couples night, if you got a boo thing like they said, bring your boo thing. Especially if you got a boo thing. Bring that dude or, or whatever. Bring her, okay? Come to couples night. Pray the prayers. Like whatever it is that we're doing, just do it for one year and just see after one year. Mark down the date. I challenge you. I challenge some of you today. Mark down the date. All right, God, I'm going to test it. Here it is. Here's the date. April 7th, 2024. I'm going all in. I'm going to see April 7th of next year what my life looked like. I promise you, you're not going to be exactly where you need to be, but you'll be, you'll be so much further along than where you were, okay? God's inviting you. No matter where you're at, he's inviting you to take a next step deeper into the rivers of living water. In fact, there's, I love this prophecy in the Old Testament that describes it. In the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel gets this vision from an angel of the rivers of living water flowing from the temple of God. From the presence of God, these rivers, and it was a, a river that, that, that went from shallow to deep, and the angel kind of took out a measuring tape and led Ezekiel through it. Let me show it to you. It says, as the man, the angel went eastward with a measuring line in his hand. He measured off a thousand cubits and led me into a spiritual experience, look, through the water. But as I was only willing to go ankle deep, and that's where some of you are at today. You're like, well, I don't want to get wet, but I sure don't want to go to hell. So let me just get Jesus. Uh, I just need Jesus in my life. Save me from hell. Save me from my sins. And that's where some of you are at. You're in an ankle deep experience, but there is more God has for you. Look what it says. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. You went a little bit further. Some of you did that today. You're like, I don't get the whole worship thing, but you came in here and that third song hit and you're like, oh. You just, like your hand just went up by itself. You're like, oh. And, and I love that. I love that, that here at Discovery, I always dream about a church that's on different stages of their spiritual experience and everywhere in between. But you went a little bit deeper during worship or something. You said, wow. And then, but there's more. There's more. And then and look what it says. He, he kind of measures off another thousand and led me through the water that was up to the waist. I want you to notice that all three of these are like, I'm wet, but I'm still in control. My feet are still on the bottom of this. See, in, in, in the waist, though, some of you are there where you can, when you're up to the waist, in, in the river of God, you can feel the current hit you a little bit more, right? And some of you are there where you, can, you, you sense the move of God and God moving in your life and directing your life. You feel the current of God saying, hey, 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 it's time. Can you feel it? Hey, don't. hey, stop. That's enough. Can you feel it? Hey, no, no. How about this? Go here. Yes. No. And you feel the currents. And, but, but you still got your feet on the ground so you can kind of resist the flow of God. That's where some of you are at. Oh, I feel them. Mm. Mm -mm. But there's more. Then he measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I couldn't even cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in a river no one could cross. So now, now, now in the middle of the river, you flow where the current takes you. Where the rivers of living water, I flow with it. You know, because my feet aren't on the bottom anymore. I don't, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not resisting anymore. I'm going with the flow of the Spirit. It's a Spirit-empowered life. Now, in the beginning of the message was for that jacuzzi hot tub, was, was for those, those, those of us that have a form of religion without power. You got bubbles in heat, but it's powered by electricity. Your, your spirituality is powered by electricity, not the Spirit. It's man-made. In this part of the message, I, I, I'm talking to some people that have you're playing in the shallow end. You're just giving God a little bit, ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep. You know the thing about the shallow end of the river? Parasites grow there. Foreign bodies grow there. Algae grows there. Things that destroy grow there. And some of you are wondering, why is this still on, in my life? Why can't I shake this? Why do I react like this? Why this happen? Oh, oh. And, 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 and the, the reason why is because where you're, where you're at in the river, it's where it grows. You were never intended to live there in ankle deep, waist deep water where the river is not flowing. In fact, in verse nine, look at this. Verse nine, it says, in the middle of the river, 
there will be large numbers of fish because the water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. There's life there. Okay? Because now I'm going with the current. I'm not, I'm not in control. I'm not moving by my flesh where my feet take me. I'm going where the Spirit takes me. And there is more. And there is more. And God invites you into separate experiences, little by little, step by step, to experience His power. Can I just pray that over? Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.